Welcome, everybody, to Radicalized Truth Survives. I believe we're on episode 72. My name is Heidi Kuda. I'm here with High Fidelity and Jim Stewartson. We are an investigative show about disinformation, and we also are bringing you uh, many reports from the war in Ukraine. Uh, today, we have war correspondent Paul Conroy with us. He's an incredible videographer and photographer uh, now on his 19th war, and we're really looking forward to bringing you his um interview it's amazing how you doing fellas good good paul is a badass stick around yeah i'm not i'm not quite as intense as our guest but i'm almost there he's uh, amazing he's amazing yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you know you don't even want to try and be in the same conversation with that guy uh but and metal and he's so cool. That's the other thing. He's so incredibly cool. All right. So uh, let's jump into Front Loaded so we can get to that interview. Front Loaded. Uh, today, we're going to start with a report from Byline Supplement by Max Colbert. And it is uh, about Palantir and how it's becoming in a very important private player in the administration of Britain. I wanted to start here because this quote that he opens with from Alexander Karp, the CEO of Palantir Technologies, is a bit worrisome. The quote says, when the whole world is using Palantir, they can still not like us. They'll have no choice. Um, we talked a lot about Palantir on this show, but the fact that it is now you know, employing more people in London than in Silicon Valley um, it's a bit of a concern to me. What say you boys? Oh, hi. Thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. Need to get that one out of the way. There's more to come. All right. There's yeah. many uh, more to come. You, you got your word in now. No. So listen, uh, Palantir is a global infection uh, controlled by the closest approximation to the Antichrist in existence, Peter fucking Thiel. He should not be anywhere near anyone's private data, their medical data. For God's sake, the man's entire existence is about dismantling liberal democracy and profiting on the way down. Why in the fuck would the NHS, the health service, that's supposed to be keeping people fucking healthy, give data to the guy who literally paid to get Pizzagate and QAnon started, for fuck's sake? He, Peter Thiel's the same guy who funded MAGA3X which ran psychological operations on Hillary Clinton using what? Cambridge Analytica data. Palantir is Cam. I wrote this. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you a tweet that I said. I said Cambridge Analytica, uh, that Palantir is Cambridge Analytica on steroids and meth. Yeah. Saw that. <laughs> like, yeah. it is, it's not just bigger it's more aggressive and it's got a very very dangerous man at the head of it yes high five so um i just want to give some facts uh you know fact one is that peter Thiel was the first investor in facebook and uh after peter Thiel invested in facebook a russian israeli named yuri milner invested in facebook and then a uh, name that you will hear out of me quite often, Sergey Grishin invested $2 billion in Facebook. Uh, during The Great Hack, if you've seen that movie on Netflix, uh, Palantir actually aided Cambridge Analytica in scraping data from Facebook. Palantir, founded and funded by Peter Thiel, aided Cambridge Analytica to scrape data from Facebook where Peter Thiel was a board member. I don't know why people can't see that connection, but I wanna make sure you know about it. Thank you for that, Hi-Fi. Um, I can always rely on you guys just really 
recalling the very important details that the greater media continues to ignore. The last thing I wanna say on this story, and this comes right from the byline supplement report, the NHS deals came after Palantir lobbied health officials in 2019, months before the pandemic. A recent investigation by Bloomberg revealed Palantir's plans to buy their way into the NHS by purchasing smaller firms who already had an ongoing relationship with the health service. And here is the point I want to get to. Email sent by Palantir regional head Lewis Mosley revealed an intention to, quote, take a lot of ground and take down a lot of political resistance by hoovering up smaller businesses. You, you know you know how much they, they charged NHS or they want to charge NHS for all of their services? One fucking dollar. Yeah. Damn. Why is that? Why is it that Peter fucking Thiel is so generous? He's only going to charge the United Kingdom one dollar. Guess. Guess why that is. If And this is important. If the product is free, you are the product. Yeah. Well, so that's why I wanted to open with that story, because these uh, the cult of the tech bro genius uh, continues to infect our world. Um, they're not they're not they're they're super villains, as Hi-Fi says. They went to some super villain academy and uh, well, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're, in tr we're in trouble. We're in trouble. I need that fucking button. <laughs> Gotta garbage. give it to Jim. Gotta give it to Jim. Yeah, we could go on and on. If I if I gave guy. him the button, we'd just be here all day with that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I, I mentioned the movie The Great Hack, and you can watch that on Netflix. The other thing I think people need to really, really watch is a, a film from one of our former guests, uh, Data and Disinformation investigating Cambridge Analytica. And that's by Charles Creel and Kat yeah. Gellin. Yeah. And in that movie, they talk about how medical data is used yeah. to specifically target people. Yeah, This is important. Your data is being weaponized against you. Why would you give it to a sociopathic billionaire? Yeah. And we also must thank our friend Brent Allpress for doing so much research in that space. As we often say, part of uh, what is infecting our world is what is legal, and that should not be. All right, so moving on to item number two, uh, I'm going to look at a thread that has been seen by 9 million people um, from Timothy Snyder from almost a year ago, January 2023. Now, Jim and I have reported on this story a lot. Both of us have reported on the uh, issues with the FBI and Russia. But I want to revisit this because he talks about how he had like a vague idea there's something wrong with the FBI. And then we learn that Charles McGonagall was taking money from Oleg Deripaska. And, and he does this incredible thread that really gets granular on what happened in 2016 and what I am what what I'm trying to make people think about is we made it so fucking easy for the Russians and the traitors in America too few of us were fighting for the integrity of our country when we knew there was something wrong too many obeyed in advance and we are now seeing the malignancy that happened in 2016 happening in real time in Congress in 2023. And I fear that we're making it too fucking easy for them again. And too many people are obeying in advance. And I would challenge people to not do that. We need more people fighting on the front lines of the information war. So what's happening in Ukraine as Paul is going to talk to us about, doesn't come here, that we don't wake up when the bombs start dropping over our head, that we wake up a little bit sooner. 
So that's why I wanted that to be the second front-loaded item. I, I just want to say that Timothy Snyder, he does get very granular and into detail, but the overarching theme of that thread is that the systems that are supposed to protect us as Americans and the systems that are supposed to protect us as global residents, as humanity, have failed and they have been co-opted by those who would wish us harm and wish to dominate us. I mean, listen, why in the fuck is it our responsibility <laughs> to tell people about this shit? Seriously, why is it that the FBI puts out some, yeah, a little notice about Russia and it's two pages long that says absolutely fucking nothing at all. And then the, Chris Ray goes on 60 minutes to cry about fucking China and how, how he's doing 2,000 investigations into Chinese intellectual property stuff. I'm sorry. Take like a couple dozen of those and fucking investigate the Russians who are actually subverting the goddamn government and the citizenry yeah. of the United States of America. Like the fuck. I'm yeah. sorry. Like, you Thank know, I you. Mean, you all turned up and you started with Peter Thiel and then you do <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get worse on item number three. Thank you for that. I just, it's just important. It's like, wake up before the bombs come, people. Please wake up. I mean, they're already here in mass shootings, but it will only get worse if you continue to obey in advance. Um, so, to ensure that I continue to get um, Jim turked up. We're going to go to number 10 in my American Monster series, where I profile Eric Prince. I open with a quote from Robert Mueller's Iron Triangle speech, which in 2011 warned us about people like him. And as is often the case that I'm seeing that the monsters hide in plain sight, that they all are united in poisoning the world with disinformation. And honestly, I, the moment I press send on this one, it's like I literally got such a chill in my bones because when you want to talk about supervillains going to the Supervillain Academy, I think that Prince would be a great candidate dating back to his time interning with Dana Rohrabacher because George H.W. Bush was just far too liberal. He wanted clean air and he wasn't anti-gay. So, I mean... Uh, I, I bring this up for a few reasons. This is from my Betty Dangerous Substack, but I'm seeing in the people that I'm profiling that they, one of the things that unites them, there are many things that unites them, but they have all been poisoning our world with lies, disinformation, and directly tied to the Kremlin. So, so Eric Prince, uh, is, is so speaking of Peter fucking Thiel, um, you know, I, I don't know if they're lovers or not. I, I you know, I, I have no idea. However, <laughs> they've known each other for a long time and constantly uh, supporting each other behind the scenes. Um, going back to Hi-Fi Hi was talking about when Palantir was going to infiltrate WikiLeaks and infiltrate Glenn Greenwald in order to 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 turn to infiltrate them, right? And what happened immediately after that? WikiLeaks started posting everything that the Russians wanted them to post. And Glenn Greenwald went full Botnik immediately, right? These people have been been together for a long time. And Eric Prince was in Afghanistan and Iraq murdering Muslims for sport, right? Eric Prince, and this is important, 
is not just a, a spreader of disinformation, although he is that. He's a trainer of people to wage war. That's what he does. Now, that war can be on two fronts. One, the kinetic war. He's very good at that. He creates private military companies like he, you know, makes breakfast or what, whatever. But he is also, and this is very important, extremely good at psychological warfare and, and combining psychological warfare with active measures. So he's got this fucking training camp up in, in, uh, in Wyoming where he trains people how to infiltrate. He trains stalkers. He trains digital soldiers. So a lot of these motherfuckers, literally, that are that have been chasing us around, were ch were trained in Wyoming at Eric Prince's ranch. Yeah, and, and, uh, and this is a really it, it brings it. And you were right. This turned me up because this motherfucker ties directly to the people causing us harm. Yeah, to Peter Thiel and to Mike fucking Flynn. Yeah. And he, you know, it was on Steve Bannon's show three fucking days ago. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, fuck Eric Prince. Well, when you, the dark horse he rode it on. When you look at the breadth of the harms that he causes, and then you just kind of remember, oh, yeah, Project Veritas. That is some evil shit. Just that one thing. Just, just that one, just that one thing. Those were, those were like the, the, the foot soldiers, right? The Project Veritas was the foot soldiers. Like the, the, the real nasty motherfuckers were trained up there too. But, but you just look at James O'Keefe and Project mm -hmm. Veritas, which was trained. Those people that went into, you know, into to rat fuck people to get vaccine disinformation or whatever the hell they were they were trying to get they were trained in wyoming at eric prince's ranch and it's it's not just project veritas no, it's a no. bunch of these people that you see a bunch of the the liars the propagandists the full-time operators that we warn about that people yeah. get fooled by yeah these people are trained there's a reason why they all have they're all sociopathic. There's a reason why they have no regard for other humans is because they've been put through training that enables them to do that. You, you have to be kind of a psychopath to even want, want to do it in the first place yeah. Um, yeah. or to keep doing it after, you know, you see the impact it has on yeah, people. Yeah, the harms. Um, yeah. However, um, there is a, you know, as we talked about and apologies are in my plane the, the people with empathy can get that stripped away mm -hmm. right if you, it, we've seen so many people that that used to be decent loving people just turn into amoral sociopaths um and and what happens with eric prince what he does when he trains people is that but weaponized like a laser yeah and that's why he is in the American Monster series. Um, so thank you for that. That was a hell of an opening to our show. And now, why does it matter, High Fidelity? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why High Fidelity? First story this week, we're going to talk about the Ballad of Lambert and Logan. Because indicted Michigan lawyer Stephanie Lambert, in her communications with Cyber Ninja's owner Doug Logan, uh, literally pushed Mr. Logan to deliver false and misleading statements for the fake Arizona audit report that was intended to undermine Joe Biden's results of victory in Arizona. And the reason Doug Logan is so very important, if you read this story from AZ Central, uh, you learn that Doug Logan is spending a lot of time talking 
to Stephanie Lambert about how his finances are such a mess and so absolutely terribly awful, except I would remind our audience that directly before he began his audits of the 2020 elections, uh, Mr. Doug Logan's $400,000 mortgage for his brand new house mysteriously was paid off. And that's kind of why it matters. Yeah, who broke that story, I wonder? Hmm. Hmm. I don't remember, Jim. <laughs> oh, sorry, also, they're, they're in, in those same, and they're, by the way, those text messages are banana balls. If, if, like, if you look at all the actual, I mean, and one of the people I wanted to mention that Doug Logan spent an extraordinary amount of time texting with is Christina Bobsky. Christina Bobsky, as our viewers may recall, and my readers certainly do, um, was Mike Flynn's lawyer in Afghanistan for years and traveled around with him and Eric fucking Prince in Afghanistan. And what happened to her? All of a sudden, she's this operative, right? All of a sudden, she's a journalist. She's not a fucking journalist. She's a lawyer. Never a journalist in her life and not, you know, shouldn't be. But <laughs> where she is, a fucking OAN, right? Our yeah. RSBN on mm. the most Kremlin shit uh -huh. in the entire universe. All of a sudden, oh. she's like a personality. And then guess what? She is writes the fucking Eastman memo. The Eastman memo meant to overthrow the goddamn government of the country. And does anyone know who the last person who gave their final go-ahead that it was ready to go? Anybody know who that was? Michael T. motherfucking Flynn. He said, oh, there's a typo, but other than that, I'm good. So the, the, there's a reason why we talk all, about all these people, and there's a reason why we talk about all these connections between them. Because it's the same motherfuckers doing all this stupid shit. And all we have to do is wake up and put them in prison. That's it. Yeah, Doug Logan, is a, he's an interesting character and someone needs to put him under some uh, deep scrutiny and some intense pressure for his involvement uh, in this mess. And speaking of messes, that takes us to our next story this week. Will no one rid me? of these meddlesome billionaires because as the Washington spectator was kind enough to point out hard right billionaires are spending lavishly state and federal courts. And this one focuses mainly on this individual here, Mr. Jeff Yass. Uh, however, we've also talked about Peter Thiel. We've talked about Leonard Leo. Harlan Crow. About Harlan, Harlan Crow. Crow. I, America has a plague of billionaires. This is a class war. It is a global class war. Billionaires are spending money to oppress people and cause the destruction of civilization because they think they're going to come out on top. Well, and that's also, why it matters. Thank you, Hi-Fi. Also, some of those billionaires are actually fraud. Uh, fraudsters perpetuated on our country that uh, basically were propped up by the Kremlin. So they're just like the oligarchs that we expose on the show. We have our own in this country. Jim. The, the, Elon Musk. The systemic problem that we have is that psychopathy is um, is a benefit. Yeah. We need we need to make it like a bad thing if you're a psychopath uh, who wants to impose your will on other human beings to their detriment. Yeah. That 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 fundamentally and and. It's capitalism, and I, won't, I, I may have said this before. Capitalism is gasoline, right? If you take capitalism and you put it in a big fucking engine with lots of metal around it and, lot, and regulate it very carefully so that only a very tiny amount goes in at a specific time, it can make you go places. It's amazing. But if you take the same gasoline and drop a match in the can what's gonna fucking happen yeah. you're gonna die yeah you're gonna die it will kill you it's the same fucking thing 
You don't want to drink gasoline. You don't want to throw it on the ground. You don't want to do all this, all this bullshit that they're trying to make you do with it. We got to get back to the idea that it's okay that the country, the government does stuff for you. And <laughs> that, that it's not socialism. We're not fucking communists. Right? So, sorry, I'm, I'm going off. Nah, it's good stuff. It's important. It's important. We've come up today, all you guys. We we've come to we've come to just sort of be an acceptance about these things, and we can't be. And we'll talk about Citizens United some more. It, you, if listen, if you have nine hundred and ninety nine million motherfucking dollars, <laughs> you can Some's, stop. Something ain't right. You, you can stop. Right. You you did it. You win. Yeah. Congratulations. You got to the very top of the pyramid. Congrats. Now yeah. shut the fuck up. Unfortunately, some of them are being called up for uh, war duty right now. Elon Musk yeah. uh, uh, yeah. is one example. So, all right, High Five. What's the last item on the menu? The final item on the menu is not necessarily a news story, but it's a story about news stories because as I was scrolling uh, through Twitter, I saw this tweet from Mr. Peter Jukes mm, and yeah. uh, the second time bylines byline times has had an original article about Russian interference removed because of a digital millennium copyright act. Yeah. If you don't know mm. what a digital millennium copyright act is, that's a law that was passed to protect intellectual property on the internet. And here's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act removal that Mr. Jukes presented. And uh, this is interesting to me because, yes, oligarchs pay for this. Yeah. But one of the reasons that I was kicked off of Twitter the original time yeah. was because yeah. the oligarch we mentioned earlier, Sergey okay. Grishin, yeah. weaponized the DMCA against me as well. This yeah. is showing a pattern of behavior in which United States laws are being weaponized by foreign elements against the citizens of democracies yeah. uh, to overthrow those democracies. Yeah. And that's why it matters. Absolutely. They're trying to take people off the chessboard who are actually telling the truths of their corruption. And that would include <clears throat> Peter Jukes and the work that Byline does and High Fidelity right here. And that's why it and matters. that just kind of leads us. Uh, uh, yeah, that I, just kind of no, leads us. I will also take them. <laughs> some, some of the heat there. But these motherfuckers have been chasing me off the internet forever. And I keep coming back. Keep coming yes. back like black mold or some shit. I'm not, I'm not going away. I'm not going away. <laughs> not Ooh. going away. No, our, our job. We're just going to turn gonna... the whole thing into a hellscape. Jim Stewartson's Hellscape. Oh, fuck. Thousands of Jews are being murdered in Israel. Thousands of Muslims are being murdered in Gaza. And thousands and thousands of Christians are being murdered in Ukraine. Who is supporting all of these slaughters all of these murders all of these arguable genocides putin right putin backs hamas putin backs hezbollah and iran putin backs netanyahu who was warned about the hamas attack and did nothing Putin is slaughtering Ukrainians, kidnapping their children to brainwash them. And he's creating a massive death cult in the United States of America. Seems to me that we have a big problem, which is that all of us most of us, at least, are complicit in ignoring the actual problem. We're too busy talking about the effects 
of anti-Semitism because of what's happening in Gaza and Islamophobia because of what's happening in Israel. And in the meantime, we're forgetting about what's happening in Ukraine as designed. The president of the United States, the military, needs to stop lying, stop pretending this is not what it is, that we're not being manipulated, not just in America, but now around the world, to a fucking world war, to a holy war, based on millennia old biblical mythology over a sliver of land in the desert. It's fucking Putin, guys. QAnon is not a conspiracy theory that just plopped up out of nowhere. It's a Kremlin psychological operation being run by American traitors. We know this now. We know what happened in 2016. We know how January 6th rolled out and who was responsible. The man in charge of making January 6th happen, Mike Flynn, did it in conjunction with the President of the United States, who, as we all know, sat, stood with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki and said he trusted Putin over our own intelligence agencies. We have to stop calling these things conspiracy theories and disinformation. They're fucking war, psychological war being conducted by a foreign enemy nation state and his American allies. I am very tired of the mainstream media fiddling their way into fascism because they get sued by the worst traitor in American history or whatever, because they're too fucking intimidated because they get trolled on Twitter because they're fucking cowards. Let me tell you about courage. Courage is the the women that I hang, hang out with who are tugging babies uh, off to the grocery store and kids off to soccer practice while they expose the shit out of all these people that the FBI, the DOJ, the military ought to be do something, doing something about. But we're incapable of it so we're relying on on independent people trying to get the word out somebody out there in the government the military the media fucking anybody start telling the truth we know what it is. Start saying Mike Flynn's name. Start saying psychological operations, psychological warfare. Start putting the blame on Vladimir Putin where it belongs. We need to defeat him. We're at war with him, whether we like it or not. We am very, very sick of being at war, feeling the pain of it, and having nobody admit it's real fucking real everybody who's lost their mom or their aunt or their brother or their sister or anybody to this cult can tell you it's fucking real stop pretending stop going on tv and and making stuff up covering for what you know is going on Mr. President, fucking be honest, Joe. We know you can do it. 
Start telling us what this is. Explain what's happening over in the Middle East and who's responsible for it. Stop pretending this isn't real. Arrest Mike Flynn. It's our honor now to uh, introduce our friends to Paul Conroy. He is a veteran of 19 wars. He is a filmmaker, photographer. His work is incredible. Our friends will have seen him in the film clips that we have shown of Under Deadly Skies, Ukraine's Eastern Front. Let's watch one of those clips now. Let's go. Let's get out of this city. Let's just not drive while it's going mental, right? Get yourself down. Is it, getting, is it going to get closer? I don't know, Callum. We're just waiting and see now. What have I said about the best place to be in any situation is on the ground, mate. If you're in a car, if you're driving, if you're running, you're high. Where's the arena? She's right there, but she'll come in the car. Serena, let's get in the car. We're going to drive out now before it happens again. Paul Conroy, we are so grateful that you joined Radicalize today. And we have had Zarina on the show many times. Uh, and we have featured um, Under Deadly Skies many times. Uh, can you please tell our viewers what was going on in that moment, uh, in that clip that we just saw? Um, we were in a in a town called Kramatorsk, and 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 it was under attack. It was it's about um, twenty miles from Bakhmut, which was the de facto front line at the time. And um, we were in Kramatorsk anyway. Then we heard um, the sound of a, an attack in the in the south part of the city. <clears throat> So we went we went driving looking for it to see if we could find out what, what, what was being attacked. It's generally civilians. Um, and we did locate a guy who said the attack was just just over the road. And as he said that, I heard a rocket come in and then exploded. And it was actually um, a cluster munition. So what happens is you get the sound of the explosion of the rocket and then it drops the bomblets out. And wh what you see is in the car, we stop jump out of the car and Kalen, the cameraman, to his credit, it was his first, it was his first war. Yeah. Um, Zarina was talking to the guy who told us where it was. So me and Kalen ran, ran just for the cover of the hedge, hit the ground. And Kalen kept the camera rolling as the, the cluster munition bomblets were dropping around our position. And it's quite terrifying with cluster bombs because the there's very little you can do once that explosion is, once the bomblets have been released, you just have to get on the ground, stay down, and and just hope that one of them doesn't fall on your head. And, and poor Kaylin, that's a, that's a, this is the first war zone he's been in. And he managed to keep that camera rolling and get that footage of me. And it was quite funny. What you don't see is Kaylin kind of going, are we going to live? And I'm like, Yes, but I can't guarantee, you know, it forever. You know, with this a portion of time we live. <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. I'm so glad that you um, shared that with us. And wow. now you are working with the same team, I believe, in Kherson. And can you tell us about that? Because I read uh, Zarina's war reports daily, and I just told her that I don't know what to say anymore. I don't, I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> It's it's absolutely the, the story of her son is particularly heartbreaking. I mean, all of Ukraine is heartbreaking. You, you you don't have to travel far to find trauma and tragedy. But her son in particular, because in November last year, I'm sure everybody remembers the scenes of, of liberation where the Ukrainians pulled a, a maneuver and pushed the Russians back across the Dnipro River. And and to all intents and purposes, the town was liberated. You know, there were there were literally people in the in the square with flags. The troops were coming in. It was then kind of typical 
Paris being liberated scenes. And, you know, it was a good news story coming out of Ukraine. Sadly, the Russians retreated to the other side of the river, blew the bridges behind them. And then since November of last year, they have, her son has been subjected to the most ferocious artillery bombardments. I mean, I've covered wars for over 20 years. And the last seven weeks in her son have been some of the most, you know, the most trying times that I've seen. And, and it, they've managed to reduce the population, you know, since the liberation, the population, it's down to about 20, 30,000, something like from 300,000. And that is just purely down to the Russians shelling civilian neighbor. There is nowhere that feels safe. Our apartment at night, as me and Zarina sit there, and it just shakes, the windows shake, and we just kind of look at each other and go, <clears throat> that was getting, that was pretty close. The, the, the biggest one of all was, was two days ago, just before I left. I was packing the car. Zarina was, we're on about the fifth floor. Zarina was upstairs. And there was just an almighty explosion that actually shook the car on its suspension. I dropped the bags I was packing, hit the, hit the ground. And there was just a huge orange flash in the sky. And at that point, once I saw the flash, I ran and got into shelter. But Zarina, who was upstairs, the whole flat, a, a, a rumbled and she was leaning out there. She thought I'd been hit because I'd just dropped my bags on the ground. She could see the bags and thought that was me. And it was a few minutes before we established that I was still alive. And what it was, they, they'd fired an Iskander 7, uh, 7M missile, I think it was, smack bang into the residential heart of the city. And I think they destroyed about between 15 and 20 houses. I don't know how many. Zarina's got the update. But it is a huge missile to be fired in anywhere near a civilian civilian zone. And that's been the pattern. They're dropping these aerial bombs on the city, which are just they're designed to destroy mass troop formations. They're not there's yet nothing's designed to be dropped in a civilian neighborhood. And that's the thing with your previous film with with Under Deadly Skies. It was a document of war crimes. And here you are working on the second project, continually documenting war crimes. And uh, you mentioned 20 years of war. I think Serena mentioned that you, this may be your 19th war. If you can explain to our viewers why you continue to put yourself on the kinetic front lines to bring us this very important information. It's, it's just, I mean, I, t I explain it to me kids like this. I've got, I've, I've got three boys. And they're all in the twenties now with kids themselves, and they used to say, you know, why do you, you know, why do you do this? You know, this is from when they were four and five and could vaguely understand that word. Where's dad? And I tell them, I said, look, there's every every chance that when we wake up tomorrow, you're going to be alive. I'm going to be alive. Nobody's going to come and execute me. Nobody's going to bomb the house. Probably nobody's ever going to shell our city. You know, we, we are kind of very privileged to live like that without that fear. And there's, you know, a, a vast majority of the world's population do not have that luxury. And so I just said to them, we do have it. So, you know, the concept of giving other people a voice, it, it goes back to when I started. Um, I, I, I was in the military for six years, so I kind of knew the technical aspects of war. But I, in in the late eighties, no ninety nine, I think it was. Somebody I was working in the studio, and someone said, "Will you come and take some pictures and video of an aid convoy going to the Balkans?" And it was Kosovo. So I went with them, delivered the aid, and then I went to the border. And I, I was really reticent at first about putting a camera in people's faces; it felt intrusive. But then you realised. When you did, did did that and they, they spoke to you and they told you their story, they didn't speak about it amongst themselves because they'd all been through it. It was like moaning about something that you'd all been through. But when they saw us taking pictures and listening to their stories, it was a way for them to unload and, and get that trauma out and into into somebody else. And with that comes a responsibility. If you listen to that story, then you damn well better do something with it. 
And so I kind of explain that to my kids, and that's what it is. It's you know, it's 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 them people need a voice somewhere. Someone has to go and give them a voice, and you know, it's kind of what I got to got to be good at, I guess. Amazing high five. So you were in Syria. Um, you were in Lebanon. You were in Kosovo. Now you're in Ukraine. And through all these wars, I see on the side of evil, on the side of war crimes, on the side of indiscriminate death, I see this authoritarian power, predominantly Russia, right? But we also see it with Assad. Um, we also see it with Hezbollah. Um, and I think we see it uh, with Hamas in Israel and Palestine. What do you get a sense of what causes men to go over that cliff where they turn from warriors in a war into animals? What do you think? Cool. That's it. I mean, I, I think there's, there's, there's kind of two parts to that one. There's the people in power. And I, I, I kind of believe that you know, it, it, with with Assad, for example, his father ruled Syria with an iron an iron rod in in Hama in 1982. There was an uprising. His response was to send in jet planes and reduce the city centre to rubble. And two photographs exist of what they did there. Then, so they got away in the darkness because there's nobody there to 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 pull, put them in check. And when, just for example, the the Syrian uprising started. You know, the mother figure in the family, Daddy Assad's wife, was the one who kind of pushed this rather mild-mannered um, ophthalmist who trained and lived in London into being, you know, slaughtering 500,000 of his own people. So I think that absolute power that he had, he had, two, he had two options. He could, when they were demonstrating of listening to the crowd, they were asking for more democracy, not the overthrow. And I think you can look at Russia the same again. You know, that comes from, that's that's almost like absolute power, but from a more kind of mafia background, the St. Petersburg mafia, and there was never anybody to say no to Putin. The second part, on, on the battlefield, I think, I think soldiers on the battlefield are led, take their guidance from their political masters you know when when we were in libya and the the the, the rebels were fighting if they ever came across an, a wounded gaddafi fighter they were taken to the hospital and i watched them film them treating the opposition forces once they were injured it was a kind of etiquette of law of war that you treat the wounded whereas the russians are executing the wounded the russians are shooting prisoners of war so I think I think on the on a battlefield level, soldiers take their cue from whoever you know the the Libyan Revolution. They took it from it came from a a place of of kind of oppressed people. Gaddafi had ruled for forty two years, and they didn't want to turn into Gaddafi. They were quite aware that they didn't want to turn into Gaddafi. And I think the Russian example and the, the Syrian regime example are the opposite. You know, they just looked and thought we've been given the go ahead by our by our rulers to act and behave how we want on the battlefield, and that can lead to to terrible things. Unbelievable, Jim. Um, first of all, thanks for all of your work. Um, it's incredible. The film of Zarina uh, was mind blowing. Um, I wanted to to ask you about iran and the you know obviously this brewing uh conflict in the middle east um there were there has been reporting from some people in the U ukrainian uh underground and press that there were hezbollah uh fighters uh being exchanged um for uh access to russian military equipment etc um i'm just curious if um you you had you'd heard anything you know on the ground about that kind of thing um and just to be more honest, more generally 
how you feel this conflict in the Middle East may impact um, the situation in Ukraine. Okay, um, first part, I mean, in the Kherson, I am actually really quite cut off. And so but we got to Kherson seven weeks ago, and, and honestly, no, nobody was even looking at the Middle East. It was actually, I think, considered by many people to have, you know, been going through quite a lull, quite a, a quiet phase. Um, but being in Kherson, we are, you know, our access is is um is gifted by the ukrainian military that there, there are things going on on the the banks of the dnipro river that they don't want the press involved in you know they are good they are going across that's that's known now so we're kind of access to military information is just so difficult in ukraine that anything any connections with it on that hezbollah i would i would be absolutely guessing if i said that we're just and we have to keep we we are keeping our noses clean because we're focusing on the civilians. Of course, what's happening? To the of course. So we're, we're we're trying to do nothing to um to get ourselves kicked out to get kicked out or lose. Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So um, on on the the damage that I mean I think it I think it's already showing signs of impact on the on the war in Ukraine. I, you know, I mean, I know. That Ukraine people in UK have told me they barely see it now on the television, it, and yeah. it, it's like any any what, what I've covered. There's always a, a kind of news cliff of death that it falls off, and then you struggle to get anything out, and oh. then you get this explosion of, of violence in the Middle East. It just puts it in the shadows. But the the actual real danger is what I what I'm kind of seeing coming out of the White House and with the new the new. Republican yeah. speaker who's been elected is now talking about separating the A from you, and that starts to get into dangerous territory for Ukraine. Yes, abs yeah. absolutely. And uh, Zarina explained that many reporters who were in Ukraine then went to the Middle East, which is why it is so important that you remain. Uh, you know, uh, that you remained behind doing this work. If if it weren't for you, we would not be able to bring our viewers uh, the stories that are happening. Um, so it's very, very important to me, um, A, that you're here and B, that you continue to, you know, uh, not not abandon Ukraine because that is, um, that's that's been our fear. And we've discussed this on previous episodes. I wanted to bring up a point that, um, Zarina described what's been happening uh, in Kherson as feeling like being hunted. And that to me draws a parallel to what I understand happened in the Syrian uprising, which you were injured during and where you did lose a colleague and wrote an incredibly beautiful book about it. I've been listening to the audio version uh, all morning, which is why I'm a little fair clamped right now. Uh, can you explain to people um, what that's about and, you know, what it's like for a journalist to feel like they are the target of war? Well, I mean, yeah, that was actually, you know, we, we did win a court case um, in the States about being targeted. But uh, the, the short version is me and Marie went into, into Syria at the time when the people of Homs, the, the military, were opening fire on the protests. And we knew that we had to be, to tell the story of the people of war, we had to get into that city. So we went through like a three mile underground sewer tunnel, crawled in, came out the other side and we came into a hellscape. It was, it was um, just 20 hours a day of bombardment of a civilian neighborhood. It's a story we're covering in Ukraine now. It's the same story. Wow. Um, but we went, we, we it, it boiled down to the point where both Marie and I agreed we weren't going to get out alive. We we kind of knew that we'd left it too late. Everyone who'd taken us in was dead. So we decided to to broadcast on CNN, the BBC and Channel 4. Um, and we, we told the story of a toddler who, who died due to shrapnel wounds to the stomach. And it was heartbreaking and moving. And I think it galvanised the world for a brief moment. Six hours later, Marie Marie lay dead. Remy Oshlich, a good friend, lay dead in, in the rubble of the media center in Baba Amra. 
And it turns out that they've been watching it in the palace in Damascus. Assad saw it and just gave the order, kill the dogs. That's that's what happened. And through the aid of surveillance and then and um human intelligence, they located the media center and they just flattened it. Um cut forward ten years, eleven years. We got to her son. I think the second day we were there, we were stood outside the building in just chatting with some old ladies who were giving us their stories about what had happened. We went away the next morning, we're told, come and see this. And literally the, the spot that we'd been standing, the house next to it was just gone. It was just a pile of rubble. And somebody said, a Russian collaborator has seen you, given the information. They think it's your house. They've removed it. The next morning, we were seen going into a house. We we missed a, a grad rocket strike by maybe 20, 30 metres, blew the back windows in. And again, another target. So we, it was for the first few days, we were, we were, we were actually hunted. The, the Russians yeah. were getting information passed to them and specifically targeting us. Eventually, we moved into a, a, a kind of a, an anonymous block of flats with the key and we just kind of kept kept a low profile in and out but yeah they, you know it, it, it happens it, it did happen that we were targeted specifically well it took, i've been doing so much work um looking back at reporters and writers and playwrights and artists and the executed renaissance is something i learned about from a yale professor timothy snyder and writers and reporters and photographers, artists, we are also dangerous in a time of mass deception, in a time of grave deception. So um, I just, you know, I salute your bravery um, and I'm very, very grateful. Uh, the book I referred to is called Under the Wire, Marie Colvin's Final Assignment. And uh, can you tell our um, friends here kind of what, what it was like retelling those stories and reliving that period was that hard for you or did it feel cathartic i think you know I, in i was so badly injured i was in hospital i had a hole gone through my leg that i could put my hand through so I, I i couldn't walk i had a piece of shrapnel about four inches long under my kidneys so i was in hospital for months and i i kind of woke up <laughs> it was quite funny with, with, with this lady i'd never met sat next to the bed and she goes, Paula Miles, I made at the Sunday Times, gave me your details. Would you like to write a book? And I, I'd just come out of an operation, so I was a bit kind of still a bit whoa on the on the meds. And at this point, she should have walked away and gone, enough of this idiot. Because I just turned around and said, how many words? And she went, 90,000. And I said, can I use the same word twice? And she just looked at me like, and she was like, oh, God. <laughs> God bless Annabelle. She actually said yes and continued, but it 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 was it was cathartic. I think you know a lot of soldiers come back from war, and and actually when soldiers come back, nobody wants to listen. You know it's horrible. They their families don't want to listen. The public generally don't really want to know what goes on in a war zone, so they don't listen. But I kind of made a conscious decision. To me, that assignment never ended with Marie and Remy dead and with the Syrian people still being attacked. And I just made it my job to keep telling that, you know, to, to write the book and to keep telling the stories. And I and I think by that, I kind of got through the, I mean, there were dark days, but I think I got through the worst of it by, you know, the, 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 there was nothing left unturned in, in that whole story. I went through everything. So I'm pretty confident there were, there were no demons to jump out in the future because I, I've just talked about it so much. And, you know, I'm going back into a war zone as well. That was a, a, a little test for myself. It was like, how would I react? You know, the first time I heard artillery, I was close to it again. And and I remember the, the first shell and it was like, oh, I'm okay, thank God. High five. You, you just mentioned the, the trauma that soldiers go through. And I think one people, one thing that people don't really understand, you know, we talk about how many bombs are dropped on a city or, you know, targeting of civilian infrastructure. 
I'm more interested in your take on the trauma that the civilians go through. People who have had loved ones died, loved ones maimed, loved ones tortured. We know the Assad regime was torturing. We know that the Russians are torturing in Ukraine. You know, how do those stories affect you? And what would you say to the world about this trauma that is being inflicted by evil men? I, th- I think that the, the biggest thing I would say to the world is is listen to them stories. Do not... I keep hearing this thing about people are tired of the war. And what they mean is they're tired of hearing terrible stories about people who've been tortured, about people who've lost their lives. Um, and I think being tired of the war in this situation is a privilege that the Ukrainians get. You know, I don't... <laughs> I've sat screaming at the telly with a remote in my hand and it's many things, but it's not tiring. You know, it's, it's not, um, but they, I, I, it's, it's how do people cope? And, and I, I often wonder that I look at, think of a friend, think of someone who's got a child that's dying and you look at them and you go, how do they cope with this? I, I picture the situation and I go, I wouldn't be able to deal with that. But remarkably, when it, when it when it happens, these these people do cope, and it's kind of really humbling when they're telling you their stories, when they're telling you about the torture or the loss of their their beloved family. Just the kind of the the inner strength they do show when in your head, you know, the most dangerous thing I can do is equate back to my family when I hear their stories, when I hear the stories of loss of grief. You know, people who are missing, you know, how do you go to bed at night when your son or your husband is missing from somewhere, when your children are missing? And and it's I think it's an amazingly human it's not it's not country specific. Humans in general have this innate ability to cope with situations that if you stand back and you look, you think that's that's unsurvivable mentally. How do they cope physically? But people remarkably come through this and they are scarred and they are damaged but they come through it and that's that's what you know what i'm currently seeing in ukraine is these people with the absolute worst stories you can imagine are stood there sentient and able to tell you about it you know that's 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 the the, the strength in people amazing jim do you have a follow-up um uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I need gather, a second. gather your thoughts because I have something yeah. I want to bring up. Um, you did some beautiful photo essays in Byline Supplement. I'm looking at one right now. Uh, you know, fathers on the front. And uh, yeah. I mean, when you talk about a picture being worth a thousand words, these are incredible. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? And then I have a follow up. Yep. So they were, they were, they were soldiers of the sixty third Jaeger Brigade, and a lot depends in Ukraine on your contacts and who you know. If someone knows someone, and somebody knew these guys and said, "Paul, come down. It's the commander's birthday." Wow. And and you know the trick about getting photographs like that is not just rolling up, grabbing your camera, shoving it in people's faces. You you have to establish. A bond. So it was the commander's birthday. So we sat around all night. We sneaked a few. The front lines dry, but we did take a few bottles down with us, and we had a few drinks. <laughs> so we kind of woke up. And and by the time the next day coming round, it wasn't oh, there's a photographer here. It's Paul's here, and and literally they were just shots taken because they got used to me being round. The camera didn't, you know, it 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 wasn't parachuted in, snap, snap, snapping off. That comes through. Just catching them at them moments when when their guard is down, you know, when they're when they're slightly weary but exhausted, and and they're the moments that human, you know, that that makes them quite human. You know, you do see a lot of photographs where they look like they look like machines, you know, but people yes. aren't machines, you know. And if you can show that people aren't machines, that these were these they were all, you know, of an age that they were fathers. They were all talking about their kids. They weren't young twenty-one year olds full of Yeah. Full of adrenaline and 
you know, the, these were reflective people who were doing their best to, to defend the families. That's what the that's what the photos portray. They're so beautiful. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is that in my studies of war, uh, it always just feels like it's it's just like poor people. Poor people just get screwed all the time, time immemorial, whatever countries they're in. Every time I look and I try to understand it, I'm like, oh, these people are just really freaking poor and they're just trying to preserve what little they have. And I think I really understood that when I watched Battle of Algiers, which was designed to look like a documentary made from real fighters from Al from Algiers. It was, it was just like, I looked at them, I'm like, these people are just so fucking poor. Got everything taken from them. Is there anything that you can uh, speak to that about? Yeah, well, <laughs> you rarely see Porsches and Ferraris on the front lines. You know, I mean, the first, the first people in. You know, it's looked like you know the British military. I know them. I was in the British military for six years. You know, we 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 were defending. It was the Cold War, so we were based in Germany. But all the lads from my regiment were all local guys from. You know, joined at 16 or 17. I was from Liverpool. It was going through hard times in the 70s, 80s. City was kind of on its knees. And it was, you know, it was an appealing prospect, you know, and, and that is the world over. You know, revolutions, it's always the young people who, who want to get out there. You know, the conscripts don't get the young people. And, you know, the, the, the soldiers you see in fighting in Ukraine aren't from really from Moscow and St. Petersburg. They're from far out east or, you know, in some of the further off provinces. They're not they're not drafting from the the, the elite, the Moscow and St. Petersburg kind of elite. So it is the same. It's you know it's the it's the young it's the young generally working class men. You know, it's the same with the with most armies that that's who they draw from, you know, and, and then you get the officer class. Yeah. Which is Slightly different level, depending on your situation. But no, there are, you know, it is, it is basically, it's the young, it's the young and the, the, the you know, the people who, who just need, who, who get something out of that, that group. Right. And it's also the people whose, whose shit is being stolen. It's like, it's like when you see war, it's always like, and the people who are left, the people who can't get out, it's just, it's, it's always poor people, you know? Yeah. And I just, I, um, my heart breaks. That, that, that was Homs. That was at Homs in in Syria. That's where me and Marie wanted to get into, you know. And that was a distinctly working class sunny neighbourhood, you know. But that it was also seen as the as the, the the beaten heart of the revolution, you know. That that's not a that's not a surprise that the young working class the working class area was also the heart of the revolution. That's what Assad tried to crush. Yeah. That's where they went in the hardest at the beginning because they thought if we can rip the heart out from the from the poor, the working class who were suffering the most, then they wow. thought they could crush the revolution, but it just spread. Wow, Jim. Um, so speaking of young people, um, uh, a little earlier uh, when Heidi <laughs> gave me an opportunity to ask a question, I was kind of, Pausing uh, and and flustered because I was thinking about my own kids. Uh, you mentioned you have three sons in their in your in their twenties, as do I. I don't have any grandkids yet, but I hope to. Have I got some. one three months ago. <laughs> uh, congratulations, wow. brother! I can't. I cannot wait. That that's you know being able to to be with with kids and then be able to give them back is the perfect combination i love it i'm dreaming of it <laughs> <laughs> um but it, it brought up a lot, you know a lot of feelings um and and there's been a lot of reports about um the putin and um taking children from ukraine and basically trafficking them into russia um, and there are also reports that uh, some of those kids are being indoctrinated in Russian schools and being forced to wear Russian outfits and, you know, praise Putin and all of the things that you would expect from, you know, a Chinese communist brainwashing camp, right, from the 50s. Um, 
I, I'm wondering if you've seen that impact yourself on the ground, uh, you know, on on the, the population um, yeah. and, you know, sort of what your um, what you see in terms of the ideological kind of, you know, subversion, the, the, the indoctrination, the brainwashing that's going on, especially in kids, um, it really deeply concerns me. Yeah, well, this is this is something that particularly in her son, and um, we've 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 done one study where the, the the child had some learning disabilities and was in 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 um a kind of a school coordinator for their needs, and it was on the other side of the river. So when the Russians retreated, the family, the mother and the grandmother, lost contact with the school, the boarding school. Um, and then the turns out the boarding school had gone and that the kids had been moved once and need this poor family are now just desperately trying to find out what's happened to their to their child to their, their grandchild um and russia you know i mean russian rather bizarrely have almost admitted they've been quite been quite public about saying that they've been taking kids out and yeah. you know and 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 it's like what I kind of okay. If you're going to do it for whatever bizarre ideological reasons you think that is going to, you know, what the what they're trying to produce, you know, because it, if anything, that just turns the Ukrainians even pushes them further away than they are at the moment. You know, that that it's it's almost like the the holy grail is you kind of you would think that people would do their best to keep kids out of this, but to actually take them, you know, and and not a hundred, not two, three, four, five hundred. We're, we're talking, you know, thousands. It's, it's. A, I don't understand what they're trying to achieve, and and you know they basically, why they've almost admitted to it. You know they are being, you know, that's one of the war crimes that are, they're, they're being charged with is, is, is trafficking children. I don't well, understand. Maria Zakharova admits admits it. She yeah. she admitted openly that I think it was seventy thousand. She said yeah, I mean, the that, that they admit to that. There's you know, uh, and, and, you know. I mean, that's. I think that's one of the one of the the the, the most the, the bitter bitterest of pills for the Ukrainians. I mean, you know, God, we would all lay down our lives for our kids, and to have them, you know, some went on summer camps and just never came back. You know how that's one of them situations. How do you deal with that as a as a as a parent? You know where do you where do you find that strength? But not only that, you know that also makes it one of the reasons that Russia will never win in Ukraine. Yeah. You can't do stuff like that and then expect what kind of pyrrhic victory would you ever come if you if you occupied if they occupied, which they never will. But you know what what favors have they done themselves? What what has come of that? actually be on me hi fi i just want to point out to our audience that the uh you know when i started hearing about uh russia stealing ukrainian children i i looked for a historical reference to something like this being done and the only thing i could find was uh there was a program run by the nazis during world war ii called the levensborn program in which they would steal children from Poland, France, uh, Aryan right. children, right? That's right. And they would bring them back to Germany for uh, brainwashing and indoctrination. And yeah. and we're seeing it again. And it's yeah. just, yeah. how how is the world not enraged by this? I guess I don't understand. Well, that was my next question. Um, I just revisited a thread by uh, the author of On Tyranny uh, and the Road to Unfreedom, Tim Snyder, who has who has got an incredible series called The Making of Modern Ukraine. And um, in it, it talks about not only how the FBI, members of our own FBI in 2016 were working for the Russians, but really quite frankly, how successful the information war has been. And one of the things that I marveled at when Zarina was staying with me is that she couldn't wait to get back to Ukraine. And she's like, she explained it to me because here we're a little confused still about what's really going on. And she said, she goes to Ukraine, nobody's confused. 
about what's going yeah. on. And can you uh, say a few words about the information war? And then I've got one other quick question. Yeah, I mean, there's very, very, very clear cl clarity of vision here in Ukraine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is there is very there is no listening to what you know what pours on mass from the Kremlin. It is the Russian machine, and as I said many years ago, when when Syria was happened, the propagandists who spread the misinformation they they don't have any burden of proof there is no burden of proof exists for them all they have to do is muddy the waters and they do that by pumping out pumping out pumping out yeah. information yeah. till people just do not it's not that they people aren't stupid people aren't idiots it's just that when there's so much information being pumped into the water with no burden of proof that people just start going what, what what's true and people i know about have asked the same about the wars in syria and libya you know the the, the information war the goal is to not create an alternative story that sticks it doesn't really as long as it confuses people and gets that's people right. gets people to almost turn off because it's so hard to understand and find your way through this minefield Bingo. of disinformation Bingo. My follow-up question, just because I want to make sure I ask it before we um, have to go. You've worked with women um, correspondents, war correspondents, and is there something that you can say that sort of is a through line between the women who join you in this incredibly important work? Um, I think, I think, you know, there's a fundamental, I think that it's just an, an empathy in women that is slightly kind of Guys have a different approach to where they go in with with a, <laughs> a bit of a ah, agenda, you know. Whereas with Marie and I, you know, I, I was very much guided by Marie. But we 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 had one opportunity. The Sunday Times. We had one chance a week to bring the reality of war to people sitting with an orange juice across on in the Sunday papers, and and our chosen method that the, the way we thought we could best get across the horrors of war was to tell through the eyes of the people who have least control over their destiny it's the women and the kids it's always the women and kids in basements in bomb shelters cowering blokes can get up and go out and fight i'm sorry if i might be generalizing a bit women do fight no, we know. but we understand but the general victims of war tend you tend to find them huddled in a place with no control over their destiny and marie knew that marie wouldn't know if she was being shot at by a Spitfire or a Tomahawk cruise missile, she really didn't care what weapons were killing people. People were dying. She didn't. She didn't care about that. And I think I think there's just a natural empathy. I'm, you know, I have so much respect for Zarina, for Marie, and for many other for all the journalists, and I'll do this, but particularly the way of bringing bringing war to people in in a way that most people have a grandmother, a sister, and everyone has a mother. And if you can tell the story through their eyes, then you can get to people and make them think. Thank you for that. Um, what did the world lose when they lost Marie Colvin? They lost um, a shining light. Someone who was really, you know, really unafraid to go in and ask the questions of the people who needed questions asking to. You know, and and a sad decision to 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 kill her was done out of fear. You know, he was afraid of what she was of what she was saying, of what she was doing, of what the world was seeing coming out. You know that that was that was a a, a bully lashing out and shoot. You know, he shot the messenger quite literally, blew the messenger to pieces. I'm so glad that you survived to share these important stories with us. And how can our viewers best help you? I, I know that you and Serena are working on another film and that you're self-funding. Is there anything that our viewers can do to help help with that project? I mean, that, that that's just, just that, you know, trying to get at this point in time, especially now the focus has got shifting off Ukraine and it recedes further and further into the distance as far as news goes, 
Yeah, I guess funding is is going to be more difficult. So far, we've managed to fund it from donations from people, which has been so wonderfully well received, and mm -hmm. and hopefully well spent. You know, so I guess I guess if anyone can help out, then that's it. Because I'm pretty sure if we go to a broadcaster now and say we've got a film about a city that's being crushed to crushed into dust in Ukraine, you know, I know this business. Eyes will roll. Doors will close and you'll be left with a couple of hundred hours of footage going, oh, well, missed that chance. So, yeah, we'd like, we'd really like to finish this film. I think it's an important film in, in many ways because it, it, it you know, it's, it's a microsome of the whole Ukraine war happens in her son. Occupation, liberation, it's all happening there. So we're going to link to uh, how people can help on um, all of our social media sites. And uh, Zarina said that you just launched a new Substack, and I uh, am actually a member. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm really enjoying the Substack because the one that the Ukrainian, it's this, all the horror you hear. People are still people, and these just most amazingly funny little vignettes happen to you in a war zone and so for me it's a it's a way of writing about the people and that my interactions with the ukrainians with my kind of liverpool humor thrown in because it's it can't be all horror and gloom you you have to lighten the mood and so the substack for me is a way where i'm not under any pressure from editors I can just write about the quirky little incidents and the horrors, you know, it, but it's all mixed in in a way that it's almost like sneaking news into people's. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. By a funny stories, you know, so it's very much, it's not, de it's not, it's not horrible and depressing. It, it's kind of a light hearted look at war because, you know, people have to live through this and we're all in there together. So it's just me, Zarina. And this bunch of Ukrainians and, and, and what we do and how we how we get the news. You know, most people will, will be quite surprised of how the news has got. Oh, my you know, God. It's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, uh, where can people find that? What is the name of the Substack? That's paul.conroy at substack.com. Perfect. And, you know, come along, have a look. The last thing oh. I want to say, and maybe the guys have something else, is just that I feel like people like you help keep people like us safer. And I mean, what I mean by that is we may all have roofs over our head at the moment and it may not, I may not hear shelling outside, but it comes if we don't fight this, it comes to everyone if we don't fight this. So I am very, very grateful for the work that you do and for your big heart. Very much. Thanks, Thanks for listening to me. Just, just to to back that up. Uh, I mean, who, who, who else is gonna go into her son and live through that? Um, you know, it's it's a it's a rare bird, as they say. Um, you, you are you are in in American parlance, metal as fuck. <laughs> yes, um, that's right. I like so that. I, I, I just thank, th you, thank you so much, man. Thanks yeah, for being yeah, here. Right. It means a lot. Crazy.